AJ Park blown up again. Is it time to end the AJ Park experiment or will it continue? Nevertheless, the bullpen is being severely tested on every AJ Park start. Doesn't feel sustainable. Tons to get into ahead of a double header on a Saturday against the Cubs. This is Locked on Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins. I'm starting to get that intro nailed now, by the way. I'm your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up at Miami Marlins underscore UK. Happy Saturday, guys. Sun is shining here in the UK. I've even got even got a shadow on my face because the sun is out. What the hell is going on here in Leeds? Sun's shining. The Marlins have taken an L yesterday, but we've got two games to enjoy today. Thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen, guys. This is your team every day, of course. There is a YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe over on the YouTube channel and join me in the comments and on the YouTube channel as well. YouTube channel is called Lockdown Marlins. Search, find, subscribe, comment, do it all. This episode is brought to you and sponsored by our good friends over at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use the code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Guys, there's tons to get into. Uh, the Marlins played a UK friendly Friday game. Unfortunately, it didn't go to plan. AJ Puck was the starter, which, considering there was a double header on deck, was potentially risky considering the the need to you know pitch at least let's say 18 innings let's assume there's a need to pitch 18 innings we'll wait and see if that's required but a, a at least requirement to pitch 16 innings uh in tomorrow's game to well, today's game sorry so AJ Park was the starter and it was unfortunately more of the same but also there was there were some other signals there that were really discouraging with AJ Park. Um, we're going to talk about them in more detail. But the question will be is like, what do the Marlins do with this AJ Puck situation? Considering their plan headed into spring, considering spring performances themselves, and considering what we've seen in the four starts thus far. More broadly, I'm getting extremely excited about the prospect of an Orioles-Marlins blockbuster trade. I really am. They feel like they were perfect matches in the offseason. They remain perfect matches. We've got Rodri Munoz making his Marlins debut later today. So looking forward to that one. I'm going to talk about him briefly and what he's been doing thus far at AAA since he's joined the Marlins organization. And... Kind of linked to the AJ Puck situation, but more broadly for yesterday, I want to talk about the juice. I want to talk about the vibes. I want to talk about what I saw on a Friday game, a UK friendly Friday game. Yes, the Marlins went down early, but I was discouraged by what felt like a lifeless performance already. The 19th of April, and there's already lifeless performances. From the Marlins, it felt like very much going through the motions. Really discouraging. Really discouraging. Let's start with AJ Park, though, guys, because he is the big talking point at this juncture. So yesterday's game, let's just remind, if you didn't watch the game, and many wouldn't have got through the whole game, probably, because, boy, oh, boy, it, it started sluggish, and it, it didn't get any better. I don't think in any juncture, really. AJ Park ended up with three innings. He gave up seven hits. He gave up seven runs. All of them earned. Three walks, four Ks. He hit a guy as well. So it was, and the ERA on the year now, sitting at a, I mean, sitting at 9.22. A 9.22 ERA for AJ Puck after four starts. It's clearly suboptimal. Skip Schumacher asked about it post-game. Have you had the conversation? He responded to say, we haven't had the conversation. Everything that Skip Schumacher spoke about post-game to me suggested this will continue. Whether that's the right move, whether that's the move you, you agree with, is up for debate. But the way Skip Schumacher was talking, 
to me, suggested that this there's going to be no knee-jerk reaction here. They see AJ Park as a starter, and it's only been four starts. All four of them pretty discouraging. One, I would say, was okay, the third one. But one, two, and four, one was atrocious. Four, in many ways, was atrocious, but not quite bad as the first. But when you piece it together, it has been really poor. Again, too many walks yesterday, too much erratic work from Puck. However, the things that were really discouraging, I saw yesterday body language that suggested that AJ Puck, to me, looks defeated. He looked down. He looked down on himself. One of the first scoring situations, I think either in the first inning or the second inning, you know, AJ Puck, all he could do was laugh. It showed him he was backing up the catcher. All he could do was laugh because you either laugh or you cry, right? But as the game went on, as the as the his start went on, the body language to me got even worse. The velo wasn't there. He's been ill, clearly. He's been pushed back, and it's all been a bit of a jumble for AJ Puck, which you know, in some kind of ways, makes you question if AJ Puck was ill. Like, let's look at what the Marlins did with Christian Bethencourt. With Christian Bethencourt, he had this illness, this virus, whatever it was that's going through the clubhouse, straight to the IL. He's back now in, you know, already on the rehab stint because, you know, he, he's given the time away from the game to get over his illness. And then he's actually a triple A. And hopefully that helps because it's obviously been a struggle for Bethencourt. Anyway, the point I'm making here is Bethencourt had the illness. Straight to the IL. AJ Park, illness. He's then having to pitch through it, seemingly. Yesterday's outing. To me, VLO down. Does he have the energy? Is he feeling good? Also, you then, you know, maybe a little mental break wouldn't be the worst thing for AJ Park at this point. So I think it's really interesting that both players, AJ Park, Christian Bethencourt, both had, you know, pretty poor starts to start the year. Bethencourt to the IL. We'll wait to see what impact that makes when he comes back. But AJ Puck, no IL stint. The Marlins in instead decide to option Max Meyer. There's no reason why Max Meyer couldn't have been starting there for AJ Puck for a couple of turns through the rotation. While AJ Puck was ill, dealing with whatever he's dealing with. And equally, it, it, it gives him maybe an opportunity to work on other things away from a big league mound. Get his head right. Get the, the vibes right. For me, with AJ Puck yesterday, I saw the shoulders slump. I saw a dejected guy. I saw a guy that felt beaten. And you have to question whether this is the right role for him. Whether the role as a starter is the right role. Skip Schumacher spoke, speaks about it a lot, about the, the relievers putting him in the best position to succeed. The question we have to ask at this point is, as AJ Puck as a starter, is Skip Schumacher, Peter Bendix, putting him in the right position to succeed? Right now, we've got a guy that looks broken after four starts. And I don't mean physically. I mean mentally. AJ Puck already looks broken. And the Marlins may be counting on him, but right now they can't count on him. He's shown nothing to suggest at the you know at the big league level anyway. He's shown nothing to suggest that he can go deep into a game. Every time he pitches, the bullpen has to do it all. They have to come in and protect him. And like I mentioned, in advance of a double header, like for me, boy oh boy, it was a super risk, super risky situation. Declan Cronin came in and gave two. Bert Smith came in and gave two. And Andrew Nardi an inning. So they only needed eight innings because they got beat. So that helped in some ways. They had one less inning to cover. But Cronin, after two innings today, Bert Smith, two innings yesterday, sorry. Are they going to be available to pitch at all? You've got Lozado going. He hasn't been going deep into a game. And you've got Rodri Munoz, who's going. It's his big league debut for the Marlins anyway. And he's been absolutely disgraceful in AAA. We'll talk about his numbers sh shortly. But by the numbers anyway, he's been disgraceful 
And so what can the Marlins expect there? Is it going to be a bullpen game effectively? Is it a glorified bullpen game? Maybe it is. Maybe that's what's going to happen. Again, the lens to the point. Puck going before a doubleheader, one of which probably is a heavy bullpen game. This is going to absolutely sap the life out of the bullpen. It's going to sap the life out of them. And then after you've done, you've had this series, the four-game series with the Cubs, you then continue your road trip and you've then got three in Atlanta against the hottest team in baseball, probably the most complete team in baseball. Even Spencer Striderless Braves are still an absolute wagon, no doubt about it. Nevertheless, for Puck, for me, everything the Marlins are saying, I mean, when I say, say the Marlins, I mean Skip Schumacher. Post-game, to me, Skip is saying we're going to continue to persevere with AJ Puck. Do you agree with that? Let me know. Do I agree with it? Well, they've already made the decision. We saw what we saw in spring, and it's been a it's been a rough start, no doubt. But it is only four starts. However, we're into that phase now where you need to just have that honest and open conversation with Puck. Because if he's mentally cooked, then something has to and should change. Let's hit the first ad. Then I want to talk about Rodri Munoz, this doubleheader that's planned. Hey, Jesus Lozado going in game one. Luckily, by the way, the UK-friendly one has got Jesus Lozado, which is uh, perfect for me. Um, before we do that, though, this episode is brought to you by our good friends over at FanDuel. And it's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Plus, baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for, guys? What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel. America's number one sports book. All right, guys, back here with me, Peter Pratt. And it is Saturday, the 20th of April. The Marlins unfortunately dropped another game yesterday. They were handily beaten by the Cubs, 8 3. They were 7 to nil down after the third inning, after AJ Puck exits. It was 7 nil. The only bright spot, probably. Brian De La Cruz continuing his heater. He had a wind-assisted home run. Great to see. It would have still been a double off the wall by all accounts. Wind was blowing. It was tricky out there in the outfield yesterday. But Brian De La Cruz continues his heater. Jazz also uh, with two hits. Jazz continues his on-base streak. I think they mentioned it on the broadcast that Jazz Chisholm Jr. currently has an on-base streak. I think of 17 games. Feels like it's flying significantly under the radar. One thing I would say from Jazz this year, the walks have definitely been way up, way up from Jazz. And I know yesterday he got he got his first at bat. It was it was a dodgy blown call, you know, in the usual spot in that low and away corner where Jazz seems to get some rough calls. He had one straight after that. Then you get the ball that goes over his head. Um, in center field where he misjudged it with the wind, et cetera. But for Jazz, two hits, Brian De La Cruz, a home run. The rest, probably not too much else to say. Otto Lopez with a hit. Uh, Nick Gordon with a hit. Two RBIs for him. Uh, and Manny Rivera with a hit. But man, six hits for the fish. Um, just the one walk overall. That was Josh Bell. Nine Ks. Arias with an O for four day. You know, Arias... Let's not get into a rise. Let's talk about him another day. I want to talk about Rodri Munoz because he's starting seemingly in game two. He's going to be the extra man added to the roster. So Munoz, I don't know a ton about him. I have to be honest. Uh, and probably no one listening to this pod really knows a ton about him. But what do you do? You go and have a look and see, okay, great. You know, what's he be doing at Jacksonville? What's, what's that looking like thus far? And I have to say, I was a little bit discouraged of what I've seen thus far in terms of his Jacksonville numbers. He currently has an 0-3 record. He's appeared in three games, <clears throat> two of which as a starter. Um, he's pitched 10 and two-thirds. He's given up 13 earned runs, including three boom bats. Um, 12 walks as well. So he's in 10, 10 and two-thirds. 
He's given up 10 hits and 12 walks, 13 earned runs. Yes, you heard that correct. He's got a whip over two, just the seven Ks. His ERA currently stands at 1097. 1097. Rodri Munoz. Boy, oh boy. How did we acquire Rodri Munoz? He was a trade catch considerations from the Pirates, a DFA guy from the Pirates. He is a stereotypical uh, roster acquisition that the Rays would make. So we'll wait to see. I'm interested to see what he looks like. But you have to be honest that you you cannot be encouraged by his, his AAA numbers. Who knows? He may find his stuff. And who knows what the innings will be for, for Munoz? Like, what's the expectation? Is this effectively a bullpen game? Is he an opener? Is he just, like, going to throw two or three? And then they, you know, douse in a bit of hoeing. Again, the point is, they've got a game before. We'll wait to see how that goes. Plus, they've already had pretty much a bullpen game the day before with AJ Puck only going three innings. So, you know, it's going to be... It's going to be a big ask for the Marlins today. A huge ask. They need Jesus Lozado badly to go deep into the game. I don't even know if they'll have to make a roster move before the game. Like, you know, Birch Smith. To me, actually, Birch has, like, been looking okay for all the slander he had early doors because, well, no one's called Birch and his performances haven't been good. He wasn't with the club through spring, but he just somehow ended up on the roster. For all of that, Birch has actually been okay. He's kind of settled into it a bit. But when I look at this pen, you got to think like, okay, Hoeing, you know, can give you a couple of innings today. But you're looking at like, what can Sixto give you? What can Bender give you? You know, what can Fosha? Fosha? I mean, this is going to be a big, big test. And they need Lozado to go big time in game one. However, as we've seen with Jesus Lozado, it has not been good. Not being good. Boy, oh boy, you go to Lozado's Savant page. His off-speed, breaking ball metrics, he is like first percentile. You know, it is like meatball city when he spins it, which is really discouraging with Lozado, to be honest with you. Nevertheless, this is the type of day he needs to, you know, click it in. But we saw what the Cubs offense did to a lefty yesterday. And so... You know, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what happens. You expect Lazaro to at least have the command, <clears throat> obviously, and a better command than AJ Park with his multi walks and hit by pitch situation. But the Cubs' offense looks interesting against lefties. We just saw it. They put up seven in the first three innings against Park. Lazaro needs to go deep. Needs to go deep. I just want to go back to yesterday's game though, briefly. So, as a, as watching that game. And as discouraging as it was for all of us as fans watching the game, and I'm you know interested to know how far you went into the game. Did you watch the whole thing? I did. I went the whole way, watched it all. It felt completely lifeless. It was the type of performance and outing that feels like a performance and outing that you get in the depths of August and September on a rebuilding club when the season's gone. That's how it, it looked. And I get it. When you're down seven, seven love, in the in the third inning, it's tough. And obviously, the Marlins started to rest a few guys. We saw Arias come out of the game um, later in the game. So I get it. But overall, like it just looked completely lifeless, which is really discouraging, but not wholly unexpected. This is maybe the byproduct of it's a slow start. The Marlins now are four and sixteen. They're twelve games under five hundred, and we're still only mid-April. This is a complete disaster. The other clubs in similar situations are in like full rebuild modes. They're expected to be poor. The Marlins weren't expected to be this poor. They're at the same level as the Rockies, the same level. No, the Nats are even better. But the White Sox, the Rockies, the Nats, and the Marlins. And the Marlins somehow, even though they have much more talent on this big league roster than than all of those that I've mentioned thus far, somehow they're 12 games under 500. And that performance yesterday was probably the worst performance of the season that I've seen. Not only was AJ Puck's shoulders slumping, but it looked to me like the whole roster was slumping. 
shoulder wise. Brian De La Cruz with a home run, you know, I didn't see much buzz. I mean, I get it. It's only to go 7 1, but no juice, no buzz, no direction really with this club. The one thing that is encouraging is when I look around the National League specifically at this point, apart from the Rockies, the Nats, every other club is probably in it this year. And that's going to be really interesting for the Marlins because whilst the Rockies are rebuilding, they haven't got anything to sell. The Nats aren't, the, the Nats are rebuilding, but they're just waiting for their prospects to be working through. They aren't selling really either. I'm going to look at this deadline and the approach you know, leading up to the deadline, the Marlins have the most talent to sell by some distance, by some distance. So in many ways, we're entering into a period over the next few months where it is the perfect situation for the Marlins. They have so much talent that they're willing to listen on and to move. So the next few months, whilst on the field, it may not be pretty. But off the field, this is super critical, super critical, because it looks to me like there's at least 12 clubs in the NL that are in it. They're all going to need something. The Marlins probably have something to sell them. And how they maximize these returns is going to be super interesting. And that's really where Peter Bendix needs to excel, really, for all the PR spin for all the way things have been going in the past few months. Peter Bendix has to nail the next few months in terms of trades that are executed. He has to. It's absolutely critical. Final out of the day, then I want to talk about Orioles and Marlins specifically from a trade perspective, which I think looks particularly, particularly juicy. Um, before we do that, this episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Prize Picks. Get the right graphics going. And guys, Price Picks is the America's is the America's is America's number one fantasy sports app. With more than three million members, it is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. Agreed. You pick more or less than on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in, baby. Baseball season is fully underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less than and add them to your prize picks entry today. And you can get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Yes, sir. So what have you got to do? Simply download the app today and use the code Locked On MLB. That is all lowercase, and it is Locked On MLB, all one word too, for a first deposit match up to one hundred bucks. Reminder: Download the app today. The app is Prize Picks. Use the code Locked On MLB. Reminder: It's lowercase, all one word, for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize Picks. Pick more. Pick less. It's that easy. All right, guys, final segment here. Then we're out of here on Locked On Marlins. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen, guys. And happy Saturday. Yes, Friday was brutal. AJ Puck, we wait to see whether he makes his next start, um, which will be next week, obviously. Let me just see who that could be against. I, I don't think he hits the Braves, right? We're going to miss the Braves with Puck. Hold on a second. <laughs> I think it'll be... Yeah. Oh, boy, no. <laughs> AJ Puck, I think, will be scheduled to take on the Bravos. Oh, my days. The, the final game against the Bravos. Oh, my days. <laughs> they may decide to skip a start there. They may decide to move it around. I don't know. If so, he would get the Nats, which is the next game up. I mean, oh, man, it feels to me like you just want to let AJ Puck take a breather rather than throw him out there against the Bravos maybe throw them out there against the Nats. However, it could be like, it could be double jeopardy because if Puck gets blown up against the Nats, oh my days. Anyway, we'll wait to see how the Marlins manage it. Skip Schumacher to me post-game still emphasized we're going to continue with Puck in the rotation. A lot of people basically saying we that the experiment should be done. Done. But, well, the messaging says 
We're going to persevere. We're going to continue. I don't think the Braxton Garrett situation helps either in this. Like Braxy, you know, was obviously had a setback. Feels like a relatively midterm setback. You know, he's back to throwing at 90 feet and whatever. Like, we're still another month away minimum, I think, with Braxton Garrett. I mean, and who knows how it goes with, with everything here. Like, this injury management. The reality is there's no need to rush Braxton back. Unless, of course, you're looking to move Braxy. Unless, of course, you're trying to maybe rely on Braxy's 23 season. But I think at this point, it's just about getting healthy. And I think at this point, just take it slow and steady with Braxton Garrett which means AJ Puck's required in the rotation. More broadly, I want to talk about the Orioles and the Marlins. The Orioles' farm system, continue, even though they've got a ton of studs up at the big league club right now, the Orioles' farm system, particularly Heston Kirstad, looks to be... I mean, he's having an otherworldly AAA season to this point. It's absolutely bananas what he's doing down at AAA. He's doing it again against the Marlins too. He's absolutely blowing the Marlins up um, or has been this week. So I look at the Orioles and I look at the Marlins and I continue to think, I know they tried to get something done with Lozado, you know, over, over the off season. There is, the, there will likely still remain interest in Lozado. I just wonder, you know, whether there's a deal to be done. With the Orioles and Marlins. For me, they 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 continue to match up. They need some pitching. Everyone needs pitching, but the Orioles definitely are in that bucket. They've obviously added Corbin Burns, which has really helped them. But I, I think when all's said and done, I think there will be a blockbuster with the Orioles and Marlins at some point. And it may not be Jesus Lozado. It may not. It could be one of the other guys. And this is the thing. Like the Marlins, I think, will act, they're actively listening on everyone. Clearly, Sandy and Yuri at this point, they're not going to be moved right now in, in this season. They may be moved in the offseason. Who knows? They may be moved at, at, at any point. But let's, you know, let's rule Sandy and Yuri out. But I think the rest of it, you're happy to listen on, right? And that Liz, that's Jesus Lozado. It's a resurgent and rebound, rebounding Trevor Rogers. It's maybe Eddie Cabrera that, you know, looked unplayable, untouchable in his first outing back. Let's see if he can double down on that. But it's, you know, it's Eddie Cabrera. We'll see where we're up to with Brax. Puck clearly has limited value. You've then got a Ryan Weathers that looks like, to me, the thing with Ryan Weathers is you can trust his durability over, you know, durability is a hard thing, that, you know, in, in the current game. You know, it's it's hard to manage innings and to have any kind of degree of certainty. But, for me, I look at Weathers and I look at his history. What we haven't seen is any history of injuries. Like, you can count on Weathers to give you innings. I think that's going to be super valuable for the Marlins this season. But you have to look at Weathers and think, if you can just, if you fix him, you know, and all of a sudden he's got like a sub-3 ERA, multi-years of control, and he has, you know, as good a track record as anyone of staying healthy then there's value in that. And I just want to call this out with Ryan Weathers. I, I can see a situation where there's a trade involving Weathers that is akin to the trades that the Marlins made with the Diamondbacks at the time when they went and got Starling Marte and they moved Caleb Smith I can absolutely see a situation where Ryan Weathers is Caleb Smith 2.0. Caleb Smith, if you remember, kind of came out of nowhere, was effectively the de, facto, the de facto ace for the Marlins back in the depths of the rebuild vibes. I remember in my Fish Across the Pond days, the first podcast that I hosted, you know, we were waxing lyrical about Caleb Smith and how good he was. It then started to tail away a touch. The Marlins moved him went to the Diamondbacks and has effectively never been the same dude. I absolutely see a situation where Ryan Weathers has a similar career path to Caleb Smith. The Marlins build him up. They build up his value. They make a move. Someone buys what the Marlins are selling there on that one, you know, and hope that that's sustainable. 
the Marlins get a big piece in return, multi years of control, an upside prospect, whatever it might be. You know, I, I appreciate we're entering into a different phase at the moment where they may be looking for like younger talent, more controllable talent than the Starling Marte they added with Caleb Smith. But the point I'm making is it wouldn't stun me if the Marlins moved Weathers after he's had this bounce back. And then all of a sudden, Ryan Weathers regresses back down to maybe, maybe not Padres levels. Maybe. I don't know. Could be Padres levels. But, you know, I think Weathers is a really interesting one. If he can continue to piece this together with all of the control, the pedigree, and the durability, there's value there. There is value there. The question is, is whether that value is transferable. Can he continue that success in other organizations? We've seen with the Padres, no. The answer was no. With the Marlins, it appears like yes. The question will be is, you know, who's willing to take that risk? And are the Marlins listening? They're listening on everyone, including Weathers, and they should do. And this could be, a re again, Weathers could be a really interesting fit for many clubs. How he's valued, I don't know. But I look at the Orioles system and I look at the Marlins and I know that the, the conversations happen in the offseason. I'm not saying Weathers for Heston is is, is going to happen. I, I don't I don't think it will, clearly. But, you know, he is... The Orioles, I think, have a surplus there in outfield studs. The Marlins have a surplus at pitching. The question is, is whether they can find a deal and agree on a deal. Going to wrap it up there, guys. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen. Thanks for joining me on a Saturday as well. In advance of a doubleheader, Jesus Lazardo getting the ball in game one. He needs to go deep. He needs to go deep. Otherwise, this bullpen is going to be a it's going to be obliterated for the next week. And not only have the Marlins got a doubleheader and a tough, you know, tough weekend series against the Cubs, they then head into Atlanta for a three-game series as well. So Lozado needs to go deep. It has to happen. Rodri Munoz, I'm interested to see what his role is. Nevertheless, it'll be his Marlins debut. It can't be any worse than the 10-plus ERA he's been throwing in AAA, right? It can't be worse than that. AJ Puck, to me, it sounds like the Marlins are going to persevere. However, he looks severely deflated. He looked beaten mentally. And if that's the case, the Marlins need to pivot away from this situation rapido. In general, the team yesterday looked... It looked like a, a rebuilding club in August. There was a lack of juice, which is a concern. However, more generally, as I look across baseball, a lot of clubs are in it this year. A lot of clubs added, and, they, and they'll probably still be in it. A lot of clubs may be buying. Not many clubs will be selling. And the ones that are selling may have limited amounts to sell. The Marlins could be in position A, pole position to maximize their return, this trade deadline, on the assets that really, the, they have assets. The club is underperforming. They're going to sell. And it's time to see what Pen Peter Bendix can do. Appreciate you guys. I look forward to seeing you on Monday.